Welcome to Turning Point's webinar series, Ish Initiative Ish Issues in Breast Cancer Survivorship. I'm Jill Binkley, Program Director at Turning Point and Founder. Thank you for join joining us for our third forum in the series, where we will broaden the discussion to national initiatives, policies, and models of care needed to reduce disparity in breast cancer survivorship. We are very excited about continuing the conversation with today's very accomplished moderator and panelists. We're all very aware that it is a momentous week for racial justice in America and very fitting that we're having this conversation today. I'm honored to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Cheryl Gabram, our moderator for this forum. Dr. Gabram is the Chief Scientific Officer for the center for the of, officer at Georgia Center for Oncology Research and Education in Atlanta. She's a professor emeritus at Emory University in Atlanta, as well as the uh, former director of the Avon Breast Center at Grady Hospital. Welcome, Cheryl, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jill. I'm sincerely grateful for the honor of moderating today's panel on a subject that has been close to my heart from a research and educational perspective for many years. And by way of getting started, like, I'd like to give a brief background of the importance of the topic we're discussing tonight by reviewing information that we shared in the past two forums. Next slide, please. In October, we all acknowledge that there is a need for breast cancer rehabilitation and exercise for all breast cancer survivors because there's strong evidence supporting the safety and efficacy of these approaches in the prevention and management of breast cancer related impairments. Furthermore, exercise has been shown to reduce breast cancer recurrence. So all patients can truly benefit from rehabilitation and survivorship care during and after breast cancer treatment. Next slide. Sadly though, we identified in the first form that there are significant racial disparities in breast cancer rehabilitation and survivorship. Black women encounter more physical impairments compared to white women, even in an equal access system. The research work that we partnered with Turning Point and performed at Grady testing the prospective surveillance model, where we measured and assessed patients preoperatively and postoperatively found that a third of our patients experienced significant issues following treatment. And as a surgeon, I can honestly say that I would have not ordinarily referred those patients. And so that study was key and important. Of note, at Grady, there are more than 80% of our breast cancer patients are black women. One of our panelists today will talk further about the PSM model. Also reported is the negative impact on ability to work following breast cancer treatment that is exasperated for breast, black breast cancer survivors. Next slide. So some of the key takeaways from the first forum that black breast cancer survivors have more significant survivor issues in part due to a larger burden of disease. And with the difference in burden of disease, medical and rehab care providers must be proactive and seek out people in need. So we own this as providers to identify patients for referral. Because less than 50% of minority cancer survivors are receiving care that is in accordance with NCCN guidelines. And at that forum, we also discussed some of the reasons behind these findings, and they include racism, referring to systems and practices that create and maintain racial inequality, psychosocial and cultural considerations, Black women have decreased opportunities for casual medical or health relations, thus creating a disadvantage in some knowledge transfer. We know there is hesitancy of Black women to talk about their cancer, often putting family first instead of themselves. Other factors are financial and socioeconomic. Black breast cancer survivors are more likely to have financial barriers accessing care and less likely to have access to high quality rehabilitation and survivor care. Next slide. People need to be treated, treated equitably, not equally. And this graphic, I think, demonstrates a way to understand this further. We may, we may need to give, um, provide extra steps or a boost for some of our colleagues, clients, friends, and patients. 
And an example was this when I practiced in the Avon Breast Center at uh, Grady, that we had lay patient navigators in our clinic. And so when I delivered a message, a breast cancer message diagnosis to that patient, there was a lay navigator who could come in who was a breast cancer survivor and talk to that patient as a living, breathing testimony for survivorship and beating cancer, giving hope to that patient. Diversification in the workforce can help in this process and be that extra boost as well. Having providers who look like you, who treat you, who look like me and treat me. However, this will take time. And in the meantime, teaching empathy and understanding unconscious biases as we walk in our patients' footsteps and lives is a strategy for success. Next slide. In the second form, we talked about building community connections to decrease this disparities gap. What are we doing with, not for, not to the community? With the core principle is building partnerships. We have to develop a safe space and really understand what the communities need and want. We have to avoid going into the communities with assumptions and instead lift up and empower the community. And the theme of navigation came out in this form as well. It's an important concept to connect with the community, meeting people where they are. But the bottom line is, don't just drop in and leave. Build something sustainable. Next slide. One of the panelists in the second forum summarized the five dimensions of patient-centered access to healthcare services in reaching out to the community with the five A's. And they are, be approachable. Communicating your goal may not be the way to start. Instead, listen and engage. Acceptability. We owe it to Black breast cancer survivors who take time to build trust and adjust the course if necessary. This will build acceptance. Availability and accommodation, there are no shortcuts. Often we have to educate funders, grantors, philanthropists, meaning to do well that feedback and engagement of the community is, prior, is priority. So a certain project or study may take a little bit longer than Ma predicted. Affordability, I wanna emphasize ensure sustainability of any endeavor, even after the project is completed. Appropriateness as a fit for the community needs, not ours. So with this overview of the first um, two forms, I have the distinct privilege of introducing our panelists today. So panelists, if I could have you come on the screen. So today we have with us here, Dr. Lorraine Lori Dean. She's an associate professor in, e in epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her current work focuses on social and economic determinants of disparities in cancer and HIV. She holds a doctorate in social epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health and has been the PI on multiple federally funded research grants. Her research is inspired by building the evidence based on which policies are made for those at risk for chronic disease and chronic disease survivors. Welcome, Dr. Dean. Dr. Donavis Don Fowler is a lead behavioral scientist in the Division of Violence Prevention at CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. She is the president of the Vow of Wellness LLC, a consulting company to advise healthcare providers and patients on addressing trauma to improve health outcomes. Her research evaluation interests include violence prevention, trauma-informed care, health disparities, and social determinants of health, health promotion for underserved populations, and the dynamics of, a, of effective program implementation and management. Welcome, Dr. Fowler. And finally, Dr. Nicole Stout is a research assistant professor in the Department of Hematology and Oncology at West Virginia University Cancer Institute and the associate director of the Survivorship Program. She is an internationally recognized expert and leader in the field of cancer rehabilitation and survivorship care, having received service awards from the NIH, 
the Navy Sur Surgeon General, the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, Cancer Special in Interest Group, and the Oncology Section of the American Physical Therapy Association. Okay, panel, we're looking forward to enthusiastic, targeted, and problem-solving answers tonight. So we'll start with the first question here. In the first forum, we delved into the many contributing factors to racial inequity and breast cancer survivorship outcomes. In the second forum, we began our discussion of solutions and actionable change by focusing on community engagement and the critical need to work alongside communities. Today, we will further discuss broad strategies for change and consider models of care and policy changes that will reduce disparity on a regional and national level. So panelists, talk to us about your experience and what makes you passionate about breast cancer survivorship and racial disparity. And let's start with Dr. Fowler. You can unmute yourself, please, Dr. Fowler. There we are. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Gabram. Um, my name is Dawn Fowler, and I first would like to say that I am so honored to be a part of uh, this wonderful panel of awesome researchers and Drs. Dean and Stout and Gabram as our moderator, um, who are all contributing to uh, breast cancer research in very important ways. And I am very honored as well to be a part of this panel um, due to the work and the effort of uh, Turning Point as a breast cancer rehabilitation um, agency organization and their work, their effort, their attention specifically to breast cancer survivors is so needed and all, um, many times one of a, one of a kind. So, um, so I'm, I'm just uh, delighted to be here tonight. Um, in terms of uh, my uh, training and passion um, um, to be a part of the panel, as well as to give effort and attention to uh, breast cancer research and practice. Um, in full disclosure, I am not a breast cancer researcher, I must say that. I'm a team lead and lead behavioral scientist at CDC, as uh, Dr. Gaber mentioned. Um, and there I, I supervise a team of behavioral scientists, evaluation officers, public health advisors, and we work on, we manage, we monitor our country's national uh, sexual violence prevention um, efforts, uh, where we fund uh, all of the state health departments in a few territories to do sexual violence prevention work in their respective areas. Um, the kinds of strategies that will reduce um, and help eradicate uh, sexual violence according to uh, the best available evidence. Um, just allow me to say, to add this disclaimer that's very um, necessary and important, that I'm not participating on the panel as um, uh, a C uh, the opinions or perspectives of CDC um, may not be the same as my own. And so it's necessary that you uh, recognize that. Um, I am a licensed uh, social worker in addition to um, my position uh, at CDC as a lead behavioral scientist. And so I bring a, a social and behavioral um, practice uh, perspective and it's relevant in terms of when we think about uh, sexual violence or violence against women, the kinds of um, co-occurring um, health disparities, the kinds of co-occurring risks and public health conditions that um, women can suffer from. And so my research in um, on women who are survivors of, uh, of domestic violence, that has spanned across the last 25 years, I guess, 25 plus. Um, it, feels, it feels funny to say that, but as a specific type of trauma, in addition to you know, breast cancer survivorship as another type of physical health trauma with um, emotional implications as well. And so as uh, Dr. Gabram indicated, I'm also the president of the Vow of Wellness. It's a company created to provide consultation services to healthcare providers around um, the missed uh, opportunities to address emotional and mental trauma that goes along with breast cancer survivorship. 
um, as I am a breast cancer survivor as well. And so that is to punctuate my interest and passion in this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that um, personal information as, as well. Dr. Dean, uh, maybe we can go to you. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Gabram, and for the audience for having me. Um, as Dr. Fowler mentioned, it really is a, um, a joy and a, and a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak with you all today. And, and, um, and I also elevate the work that Turning Point has been done. Um, like many people, the reason that I do the work that I do, which is research in breast cancer screening and survivorship, um, is because of a personal story. I think a lot of us come into this work because of something that personally has talked with, that touched our lives. Um, and so for me, my personal story is my great aunt Betty. So my great aunt Betty, my great, she's my great aunt. So she would be my grandfather's sister. Um, when I was in high school, had some form of cancer. And honestly, I don't know if it was breast cancer or not, but I remember even at that age, going to watch over her and my family would go to see her. We have a fairly close family. And I remember watching her literally laid out on the couch in between her, her cancer treatments. Um, and one thing that was really curious to me the entire time watching her was that she smoked cigarettes the entire time. Now I understand nicotine, nicotine is an addiction. I've done work in tobacco control myself. But even at that time, I had wondered why is she continuing to smoke cigarettes when even back then we knew that that was not going to extend her life or in increase her chances of, of living longer, even as she went through the cancer treatment. But it also made me think about what are the other parts of someone's life that we are not attentive to or that we're not thinking about. And so as a breast cancer researcher, that really impacts why I do the social determinants of screening and survivorship, because I think we have to think more holistically about what is contributing to someone's entire life and why they're engaging the, their, the behaviors that they behave. So in my Aunt Betty's case, right, this was a Black woman who grew up um, in, in a volatile part of the civil rights movement, right? So imagine the types of stress that she was under. And I say a volatile part because we're still in a civil rights movement. That was a particularly volatile part that she grew up in. As, um, but, right, maybe that's why she was smoking. Or maybe growing up in a, in a household, in an impoverished household or impoverished settings, right? Maybe that's why she was smoking. But did we ever really stop to think about what are the things that were happening even before she had ever been diagnosed with cancer that might be contributing to what's happening now? And I bring that same lens to thinking about my own research, research and my own work. Some of the work that I do looks at financial toxicity after cancer, but I think about it from the perspective of some people were already economically struggling before they even got this cancer. And we need to be thinking more about what's happening across someone's life and across someone's continuum. Those behaviors, the exercise, and we talked about exercise earlier, right? Were people even exercising before they had cancer? Now we're telling them that they need to do it afterward, right? Are we thinking about those things? Um, and then also that we can't just forget about people after the cancer treatment is done. There's so much life to live after a cancer diagnosis. And we still need to think about, well, what happens to folks 10 or 15 years down the line? So some of my work has looked at breast cancer related lymphedema, which is a chronic condition that arises among some people due to their cancer treatments and trying to understand what happens 10 or 15 years down the line? How can we continue to provide the support and the care that's needed for someone who had a condition as a result of having their cancer treatment? Um, so that's my perspective and I'll, I'll end there, but I'd also like to say that that's one of the things I'm really excited about for this panel. I think we all bring a different series of experiences and expertise that will make for a really enriching discussion. Thank you, thank you so much, very insightful. Um, Dr. Stout, how about um, share your story? Sure, thanks Dr. Gabram. And thank you to this fantastic panel, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Dean. I'm, I'm honored to be among your presence on this panel because I think you bring so much to bear to this conversation that quite frankly, we're missing. Uh, and that's really where I come from in my thinking about approaches to better managing individuals going through breast cancer treatment. And it's founded in the research and work that I did in developing the prospective surveillance model. So 
the prospective surveillance model was actually the brainchild of a surgeon. It was a brainchild of a Navy surgeon at Bethesda Naval Hospital who said he was quite frustrated with his breast cancer patients not being able to get care from a rehabilitation provider. And at that time, you know, we prioritized in the early 2000s, we were prioritizing in military medicine. We were prioritizing, rightfully so, um, individuals who were fighting wars overseas and coming home and needed trauma care and, and, and you know, our, our, um, our, our, the issues that they face in recovery. And he said, that's not a good enough answer for me because my breast cancer patients need some help. So he had the very good senses of not only hiring a physical therapist in their cancer center, developing this prospective surveillance model, uh, and then opening the research protocol. I came into, I very luckily stepped into that situation by virtue of two of my mentors who ushered me in because they wanted someone to come in to help them run these studies. Prospective surveillance is a construct that puts the rehab provider at the point of diagnosis to understand that all important baseline. And from the rehabilitation provider's perspective, when we built the studies, we were thinking about function. How do they move? What are their activities, exercises, recreational behaviors, um, family situation? And we wanna understand that at baseline because essentially that's their normal state. Right, somebody diagnosed with breast cancer two or three weeks ago was working full time, um, possibly you know taking care of their of a loved one, um, was uh, going to the grocery store, was doing all of their daily household activities and chores, taking care of their children. So and now they have breast cancer. So understanding the normal state of activity, of function, of their psyche even at baseline was a critical starting place because it all changes as they move through the continuum of treatment. Different treatments are introduced uh, at different times, different side effects occur. And so by following individuals prospectively, reassessing what has changed, we can identify problems early. Now, again, we started with this foundational model in rehabilitation thinking, prospectively monitor function to identify the physical problems. We learned a whole lot more over the course of these studies being open for 10 years. We learned about the need to expand prospective surveillance to ask questions about family situations, financial situations, because those things would come up as we would follow these individuals with repeated visits. Um, not only are we assessing their function, we're developing a relationship with them, we're talking with them, we're understanding the environment in which they live, we're understanding their behaviors and how their behaviors changed. So we had very fruitful um, publications out of the prospective surveillance model. I had um, the wonderful opportunity to work with Dr. Jill Binkley, with Dr. Katie Schmitz, to bring together uh, a, a collaborative working group through the American Cancer Society that looked at this model and said, this is a framework for what we should put forward for all breast cancer patients and survivors. Um, and great, that was in 2012. And, but that wasn't the end. In my mind, that was just the beginning. And the more that I now work in a setting that is very rural, uh, we have a lot of issues with health literacy. We have many issues in um, rural America with access to care. Um, I see very much firsthand how prospective surveillance needs to be expanded vastly. And the things that Dr. Fowler and Dr. Dean bring to the table in this discussion, we should be assessing the home status and situation, spousal relationships, um, issues with domestic violence that people may be experiencing, that influences their care. So does their financial status. So it influences their psyche, their sleep. All of these factors come together. And by using the prospective surveillance model really very broadly to assess and continue to assess individuals, that's my passion is let's take this to the next level. It's gonna help us to better engage in the communities. It's gonna help us to better engage trust with individuals because we build a relationship with them. We, I like to say, we walk with them through the course of their cancer treatments. And we're right there when things begin to happen and begin to deteriorate. We can identify them early and we can help to find the remedies that they need. 
So my that's my my research background and my interest. Obviously, my passion really is, as I said, to take this to the next level. I think for too long we have in in medicine and specifically in oncology, we've used words like precision medicine, and we use those when we think about treating the disease, and that's great, right? We have markers that we can identify, targeted therapies and treatments. We're missing precision medicine for the human being that's going through cancer treatment. And I think that's what prospective surveillance can afford to us through the mechanism of ongoing assessment of the many factors, the behavioral factors, the environmental factors, the social determinants, the family, bring it all in because all of that influences the outcomes. And we know that those influences are different for African-American women, they're different in Asian communities, they're different based on cultural preferences. So if we really are talking about precision medicine, we're re we, we really are talking about equity. We should be, that should be the conversation. And I, I don't think we're there yet. And that's, I think why we're here. <laughs> well, thank you all very uplifting stories and appreciate your passion for um, this subject. So. In past forums, we have identified models of care, and thank you, um, Dr. Stell, for already talking about the prospective um, surveillance model, because if we had those models and if we instituted them, then perhaps we could reduce some of the disparity in survivorship outcomes because we would have a standard way to move forward and treat patients. Um, focus navigation is another methodology to achieve that as a model that could possibly reduce uh, disparities. So how about, um, Dr. Dean, what are your thoughts about um, approaches and other models that could result in more equitable care? So I very much appreciate the work that's been done in thinking about these models of care, but I'd actually like to take this question in a little bit of a different direction um, to say that I think whatever model that we use, the care needs to be inclusive and equitable. Um, so, and, and I arrived at that because I mean, most of the work that I have done has focused on black women. I've looked at social structures and mammography. Um, I also worked with Dr. Katie Schmitz to look at breast cancer related lymphedema. And I, and I was looking at whether or not there were these differences in lymphedema based on race. Now I wanna be clear here. I believe race is a social construct. So I was not looking for something that I did, thought there was a biological difference. I was actually using race as an indicator of someone's social position or, or level of marginalization. But what I found was that more than race as a, as a marker of someone's social position, right? Not as genetic ancestry or anything like that. I actually found that people's socioeconomic position was more likely a driving factor in how severe their lymphedema was and their ability to manage their lymphedema. And th these are things that have been, that we've since published in the literature. But what that really told me is the bottom line was, even as black women, we are not just our race, right? And so we need to start thinking more carefully about the intersection of identities at which people live and be sure that we're attentive to their entire being. And this was really elevated for me by some of the work um, by a collaborator, Marianne Adams, who might may be on the uh, the pan the, who may be on the, um, the in the audience today, um, and her work through Zami Nobla. And together with Mary Ann and Dr. Tonya Poteet, we did some work looking at the experiences of Black sexual minority women and mammography. So this gets really interesting. We already knew that there were delays in care after follow-up care after mammography for black women. Um, and our study corroborated that. We found that the delays were twice as high for black women than white women. But then when we looked at black women who were also identified as sexual minorities, so people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, they had delays at five times the rate of white, hetero, white heterosexual women. If we hadn't looked at that, we would have been missing an entire part of the disparity that we haven't been talking about, which is that even within a subsection of Black women, right, there's other forms of identity that we need to be thinking about and incorporating into our care. We're missing an important part of that disparity, in fact, because the models that we have haven't thought about how to think about people holistically. 
So that's really my charge in, in the, the next work that I hope to be doing is to think about, okay, we have these models and I think many of them work great for, for addressing disparities, but are we still missing disparities? And are these models even really fully addressing the disparities based on the complex identities that people bring to their, to their cancer treatment and then survivorship? Thank you so much for bringing that perspective. It reminds me what Dr. Van Hughes said in our very first forum. She said, black women, black patients are not monolithic. And there's the subtle um, that you pointed out that we really have to dive a little bit deeper. Dr. Fowler, do you wanna comment on um, some approaches and models that could result in more equitable care? I'll, just, I'll add to uh, what Dr. Dean has already pointed out. And I think comments that were um, indicated earlier around the need for uh, diversity of the team, um, the team, the treatment team, the service providers. Um, Dr. Dean so poignantly pointed out the, um, the embedded disparities um, and how do we get at that, of course, is uh, the sense of the, the mechanism and the frame that needs to be used to get at that when um, unconscious bias, implicit bias is a real thing. Not only that, but for surgeons and for um, oncologists, um, the time that it takes to one, have training around this, and then two, the implementation of it. And the uptake of implementation over years where when we might see differences is, um, is also uh, a huge issue. Um, but at the table, we're missing, I think, an opportunity too to get at embedded disparities, of course, those sort of multiple layers of um, intersectionality, as well as co-occurring um, risks but this issue, again, around trauma-informed care and who's at the table. And so in my experience, the, the nurse navigator did not necessarily have the training in the background um, to, to provide that kind of um, empathy that you spoke of earlier, um, or even the knowledge sharing that's necessary. I even had an instance where an oncologist indicated, um, because of my background, he thought I knew all of this. And so the level of sensitivity <laughs> and, um, and the training that needs to happen requires um, a diverse group of care and treatment providers to get at those embedded disparities, intersectionality, co-occurring um, co -occurring risks that occur across, again, what Dr. Dean mentioned, holistically, the entire person, you know, whether it's, it's, it's the biological piece with the physical health and the uh, experience of cancer physically and physiologically, but certainly the mental health piece is the part that is often missed because we are treating the physical symptoms of the disease. And so, um, so I think the diversity of the team and what kinds of models um, provide for trauma-informed care to make sure that we are attentive to issues around how women, um, um, diverse groups of women feel safe. Um, how do we establish that level of, uh, of uh, trustworthiness, right? How do we empower women? And so um, these are the kinds of things that a trauma-informed approach would uh, help us to do. I, really Can I just actually jump back in there. Oh, so please, just, I just want to add on to Dr. Fowler's point. So yeah. I agree. I think representation is incredibly important in, in healthcare. I'd also say, though, the what we found, and this is the same work that I was doing with um, Marianne Adams and Tonya Poteet, is that training, right, training was also just very important. Make sure that people are well trained to work with different populations, even if the team itself can't be um, that, di that at least racially and ethnically, ethnically diverse. Um, and what we found is we used, um, we used a theory that talked about three different things. It was autonomy, so the extent to which people, you empowered patients to be able to make what they felt like their own decision. Um, competence, the way that you helped uh, use the patient's existing knowledge. And then relatedness, just whether or not you were able to feel like you related to the patient as a person were all things that healthcare providers could be trained to do and to empower patients to do that would increase their care. And I think that relatedness could come in terms of having a diverse team or having someone who looks like you on the team. 
But it, we also found that it could also just come with showing how you were literally alike in, in some way, um, which we thought was really interesting. That it didn't have to be you know, a provider of the same race or, or a provider of the same sexual orientation. That just being able to show your relatability was really important for patients as well and making them feel comfortable and wanting to continue on in care. I just couldn't agree with you more, Dr. Dean. And I saw that as we transitioned from a nurse practitioner navigator to another um, physician assistant. And I was really concerned when my nurse practitioner, who's Black, re related really well to the patients, Donna Grady. And when we transitioned to someone who I hired after she had left and she was white, I was a little concerned now, are the patients going to drop off? That physician assistant is incredibly empathetic. The patients love her. They have her phone number. She reaches out. So I truly believe that you can train individuals um, because it's going to take a while for that pipeline to get where we want it to um, be. Dr. Stout, do you want to comment on? I, I do. And I, I love this discussion. Um, I, I, I always keep in mind, and I think it's so critical for us to think about when we talk about a model, any model breaks down at some point. Models are totally imperfect. They are not meant to be implemented at 100, the 100, 100th percentile. We should be looking at a model through the lens of how do we expand it? How do we extend it? How do we do better? Right? The model gives us a foundation or a framework to move from. All of the points that have been brought up here by Dr. Fowler and Dr. Dean are critical to help us create models that are better, continuously improved. I feel as though when we get locked into a model, we lose our vision of the things that are happening outside of that construct. We also, I, I think we lock people out. When we lock into the model, we lock people out. We're missing asking different questions or the right questions. Um, you know, I shared about the prospective surveillance model. I was a physical therapist running this study and treating these patients. But do you know what I heard a lot about? Not just my arm problems and my chest wall tightness and my swelling. I heard a lot about my kids are struggling so much right now and I'm so afraid of how they're thinking about the diagnosis that I have and I don't know how to talk to them about it. They're getting you know, taunted at school. Um, I would hear things about, you know, my husband has pulled away from me and is, is dissociating. I'm not the person to handle that, but if I listen with empathy and I truly find a way to help them connect to the provider that does make the difference, that's how the model then expands. And I say, I need to have someone who has training in how to better relate to different populations, diverse populations, different ethnicities, um, indigenous people, their, their interests, their needs are very different. Um, and so I, I think we have to be broad and we have to be thinking broadly about these models. Um, I will highlight um, work that I, I look to as, a, um, as a, a, a shining beacon on the hill, if you will, and that's some of the community-based work that's been done out of Ohio State by uh, Dr. Elector Pasquette. Very, very much a community-based focus on navigation, and she's taken the navigation model um, to help in the community really in the construct of cancer screening and prevention. But the beauty of that work is they've gone far beyond the walls of a medical clinic. They've gone far beyond licensed healthcare providers. They train lay navigators, leaders in the community, people who are individuals who are well-known, respected, and they train them on the questions to ask, how to, how to do a needs assessment, how to understand the social constructs that your patient is experiencing and struggling with and connect them with appropriate resources. So when I think of prospective surveillance and, or I think of any model, how do we do it? How do we do it better? How do we expand the model so that we are reflecting the needs of our patients, right? The diversity of the team is absolutely critical, but it's also, it's, it's the diversity of our, our, our own empathy. It's finding shared values and, and making sure that that we have a comfort level in, in finding those bridges between the shared values and making that, um, making that connection with the patient so that they feel comfort and they trust when I say to them, 
I'm not the person to handle this, but I'm going to get you to the person who, who does. That's when the model has worked, right? It allows us and enables us to tailor for the individual and get them where they, where they need to be. So let's shift a little bit, talk about the healthcare systems and research priorities. So in attention to cancer impact, treatment side effects, patients' needs, we've already talked a little bit about unconscious bias and lack of awareness of the role of rehabilitation were identified in our first two forms as barriers within the healthcare system that contribute to, disp to disparity in survivorship outcomes. So what needs to change within the healthcare and research communities, individually and broadly? to reduce disparity in breast cancer survivorship. And we're gonna go back to Dr. Fowler. Yes, um, just to continue from the last question, I think we are touching on this in so many ways. Um, I wanna clarify um, as uh, Dr. Dean was um, going in this direction um, from my point earlier, um, the, the, the treatment team matters. You know, who's at the table, of course. And uh, what I meant by diversity of that, yes, definitely uh, racial and ethnic background of the treatment, the healthcare providers matter, right? And the more that we continue to support and get behind those kinds of um, pipeline programs from undergraduate education, undergraduate institutions up through medical school that support um, diversity in that field um, will help us to fuel and provide that kind of diversity of, those, of the background of those providers. The other part of diversity though, has, you know, has to do with um, the kinds of uh, providers who are at the table. You know, we have the surgeons, we have the oncologists, but um, we have nurse navigators, patient navigators, if you will. What is their background and training? Um, I have to say that my experience was that I had more background and training than the one I encountered. Um, is there a social worker at the table who has specific training in health disparities, in delivering um, empathy, um, in knowledge sharing, in recognizing the gaps or what might be missing. So I think that's, that's an important piece um, in terms of, of what the treatment team, you know, one, you know, what they look like, <laughs> but at the same time, what do they actually bring? What kinds of background and training they bring? And that, that's a, a point of diversity as well. So I'm glad you did bring up the uh, treatment team because I remember preparing for the first form when I had the honor of serving as a panelist, um, I'd done some research and there's a program in Ohio that in their multidisciplinary weekly breast conferences, they actually invited the physical therapists at the table. I thought we were progressive at Grady having everyone at the table, the med onc, surgeonc, rad onc, pathology, breast imaging, social workers, patient navigators, but there was a program in Ohio that actually had the physical therapist at the table. And I thought that was really um, you know, novel and thinking that we have to be more proactive in uh, that approaches as, as well. Yes, um, oh, and yeah. I was gonna say, I, I mean, I totally agree. And the follow through around that kind of um, contact, the comprehensive follow through with the team across the treatment of the patient over time is what matters. And so, and I think we've already spoken to um, Drs. Dean and Stout, um, and perhaps you even in your, uh, your uh, opening remarks, Dr. Gabriel, um, around uh, the need to do the kinds of baseline assessments of patients, survivors, um, so that we have that information first. That's not being done in the ways that we might think it, that it is. It certainly didn't happen with me. Dr. Dean or Dr. Stout, you want to comment on healthcare system and research priorities that we should um, focus on? Yeah, I, I think Dr. Fowler makes a great point. And to Dr. Gabram's point, also having those different voices at the table matter. Everyone comes at that patient story, the patient history through a different lens. We all ask different questions. We have different expertise. It's so, so vital. When I think about changes in research in this area, I think I've already alluded to how do we expand the, the prospective surveillance model by bringing those different diverse uh, providers, professionals, 
to look upon the patient with their unique lens and contribute to the plan of care. Another place where I think we haven't been quite so strong in breast cancer survivorship research, and I see it emerging, uh, is around looking at community-based models for survivorship. Um, I see some emerging models of care that are being published, um, community-centric survivorship care models, supportive care services in the community, transportation services, for example, getting the qualifications codified in policy so that an individual who needs transportation every day for radiation therapy can qualify for it and can obtain it through the county services that are available, but maybe not today available to the cancer patient. The other thing I think a lot about is qualitative methods, and we need a lot more qualitative research. It's just I know in the social behavior construct in, in public health, um, qualitative methods are, are predominant, but not so much in the clinical domain in clinical research. And I mixed methods approaches. There's nothing more valuable than the voice of the patient and the caregiver. Hearing that we have very strong evidence-based methods that can help us to collectively code and identify in a systematic way so that we create a strong evidence base that's valid, that offers perceptions, perspectives, and insight from different populations. I think that's a research agenda item that needs to be greatly broadened. The last thing I think about really is from the socioeconomic or the socioecological model are the different and varied layers to that model and the needs, the needs in that model at each layer, right? So we start at the center, which is the patient and the caregiver, and then we move to the practice or the provider level and the community, the organizational level, the hospital system, the community, et cetera multi-level interventions that address the same problem have to apply different interventions to those different levels, right? We can't, we, in, even within a level, we can't expect that an educational brochure, we can't do brochure therapy mm -hmm. and expect that it works the same for everyone. It doesn't. So really understanding those multi-level needs um, understanding the context that we need to work in for education and training of different providers at different levels. Um, our community healthcare workers and health workers, our policymakers, our payers, all of those individuals are going to require different perspectives, not just about what is breast cancer and what is breast cancer survivorship, but the nuances of exactly what we're talking about here. Precision medicine for a woman with breast cancer means you identify her specific needs, you tailor treatment to her, and that's going to be different if she is a woman of color, that's going to be different if she is uh, from an, an underserved uh, population, if she's socioeconomically challenged, uh, if her environment in her neighborhood that she lives in is, um, is, is different. We have to start the conversations and we have to Part of that is qualitative research. We have to understand the barriers there so that we can have the conversations to improve policies and improve awareness around these, uh, around these very specific nuances, not just breast cancer survivorship, but as Dr. Dean said, um, black women are not monolithic, um, and you could probably carry that to neither are Asian women and neither are um, you know, the, the heterosexual women, uh, homosexual women, it's just, a, it, we, we can't look at a group. We have to look at the individual. Again, that's the precision medicine piece. Okay. I, I mean, I love what the other panelists have, have said here. And I mean, I elevate, I love uh, Dr. Fowler's mention of thinking about the people who need to be on the team. And um, Dr. Stout, I really, I even wrote down <laughs> as a quote, you know, nothing is more important than the voice of the patient. And I agree. I, I think that that is, is a key and critical element. Um, and when you said, when you said, you know, what needs to happen in the healthcare system and where do our research priorities, the first thing I wrote down was listen to the patients, just listen to the patients. And I know that sounds, I, I know that sounds overly simple, right? But I'll give you an example. So some of the work that I've done um, looks at financial toxicity in the long term for women with a history of breast cancer. And so one of the research questions that actually the women in the study that I was running um, wanted to talk about was, well, no one ever asks us what should happen with financial toxicity. 
And they were right. I mean, there were these papers from the perspective of the physicians, from the insurers, from pharmacy benefits manager. But when I looked in the literature, there had been, I think, one other paper that had actually asked patients, and that wasn't even a central part of the paper. Um, so I ended up writing this publication highlighting this is what patients say that they would want to tackle, or this is what would they feel like they would need to, um, to have in place so that financial toxicity doesn't happen, so that they aren't crippled by the economic burdens of cancer. Um, which actually brings to the second thing, other priority that I think we all just need to acknowledge and focus on. And I say this, this is not the opinion of Johns Hopkins, this is not the opinion of the National Institutes of Health or any of my funders. I'm saying this as Lori Dean, but we need to bring down the costs of cancer care, point blank. To me, it's outrageous that we live in a country that's as resource rich as the United States, and yet people can go broke and can go bankrupt for a disease that they did not want and for a disease that they had no idea what was gonna cost them. It's wrong, it's unethical, we need to fix that. Um, we could talk about many, the many ways to fix that, but I think that's one thing that, needs to, that we just have to start talking about and just saying, it's just too much. And we have to think about the other parts of the system um, that go into why cancer costs are so high. We need to really examine all of the different parts of the system and even some of the ways in which we might be complicit, right? Um, in, in, in having those costs be high, to be honest. I think the other thing that um, I would say is really important from the research that I've done is to think about distrust. Um, so I've done some work showing that, that higher rates of distrust is linked to less completion of adjuvant treatment um, that was linked to, that was higher among racial and sexual minorities, like that work that I talked about before with um, Antonio Poteet and Marianne Adams. Um, but I also want to flip that on its head, because I think to talk about distrust somewhat blames the patient for an institution that's not been trustworthy in so many cases. So I think what we actually need to do is focus on how do we make the institutions of healthcare more trustworthy to patients because the distrust is really just a natural reflection and an expected reflection of the way that many people have been treated or the unethical treatment that has occurred. Um, so I think that, and, I, and, I, and that even takes me back to thinking about the cost, at least some of what I've seen is people question whether or not the healthcare system that we've set up is really about bettering patients or bettering someone's pockets. And I think if we don't really talk about the issues of cost and those sorts of things, we aren't going to show that the healthcare system is trustworthy and people are going to continue to distrust and we're going to continue to see these disparities. I'm, I'm so grateful that you brought up the cost issue. It's obviously burning in every platform that we engage in in healthcare right now. But I'll tell you what bothers me. What really bothers me about the cost discussion is the hypocrisy with which we approach it. We spend tens of thousands of dollars for these very expensive, very bespoke cancer treatments that have been FDA approved, that are now on formulary, that increase lifespan by 1%, but we will not pay for a physical therapist consult at baseline for a patient to get a baseline assessment. We pay for DEXA scans at baseline. We pay for echocardiograms at baseline to establish a, a, a baseline of heart function, of bone density, because we know the treatments we're gonna put people through are going to cause decline. We fail, we fail our patients because we neglect to to recognize that this is an important cost outlay to utilize prospective surveillance, social workers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, psychological counselors, fertility counselors, those people should be on board from the beginning. And when we promote that model, when we put that forward, the very first scrutiny that we hear from physicians is, well, that's gonna cost my patient more money. And I just, that, that makes me very, very frustrated because every step of the way along that cancer continuum, treatment escalates, the costs escalate exponentially more than what we, we are a cost outlay, you're right. But I think the, where, where I go with my answer to that is how do we show our value proposition? And it isn't just in dollars, right? It's in being able to empathize with the patient, having the patient feel heard, having the patient get to the right services at the right time. And I'm not talking about their treatment, their, their disease treatment. 
and talking about all of those things like the transportation, like the social worker, um, you know, like the fertility specialist, so that those things are an active part of in, in engaged in the patient's plan of care. You know, we, we, we talk a lot about systemic problems that we have um, built in systemic bias. We've got to start with systemic solutions to help to solve those things. And cost is a big part of that. But the value proposition is where I think we, we need to make our case. So that really transitions us into our last question for the panel, um, talking about national policy and funding. Um, so what specific policies or funding for survivorship care need to be changed or enforced at a national level to reduce disparity? And how would this intersect with the critical importance of culturally appropriate and community-based solutions identified in our second forum? Dr. Fowler, do you wanna kick that one off maybe? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that um, there needs to be an examination of the, the funding pipeline, the funding and, and policy pipeline, if you will. Um, we need to know uh, whether the researchers, for example, who are receiving the R01s um, at the national level, um, receiving those kinds of, uh, that kind of funding and backing and support, um, are they able to partner with the community-based orgs or those kinds of agencies who may be more of the boots on the ground to leverage those, those types of uh, culturally relevant, appropriate, um, whatever the language might be, addressing um, health disparities um, and, and finding the best practices um, for uh, certain um, populations or certain groups of survivors, you know, are they able to partner in a way that um, that uh, the that kind of funding makes it way it makes its way down to community organizations and not in a hierarchical sense at all, but the way that the 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 current structure of that is that if you're with or if you are affiliated with a research one institution of some sort, whether it's academic or um, research based. Um, and then, so you're more likely and inclined to get those funds, but is, uh, are the kinds of partnerships that would be more meaningful for certain um, survivor groups, um, are those partnerships um, happening? And so, I mean, that, that would be, I think, a major piece around the, the funding pipeline. And then if we, if we identify a model where that might be working well, how does that get leveraged and shared? Um, across researchers, across community orgs, um, so that it could be some kind of um, example um, to others. Um, do the, another question, for example, do the, um, the folks that um, hold the purse strings, you know, the national and federal level um, funders, do they know what the most poignant kinds of um, research questions associated with certain kinds of best practices for these groups? Do they know, do they have their finger on the pulse is what I'm saying around best practice and research? And if not, how do we educate them so that um, requests for proposals and um, RFAs, requests for applications can be written in such a way that these partnerships are encouraged? Um, so I think there's a whole, um, overarching way that funding and policy um, needs to be framed in order to bring those kinds of collaborations, partnerships to the table um, to get to uh, certain groups. Thank you and thank you for bringing up really connecting with the community. I'm really fortunate in my new position as the Chief Scientific Officer at Georgia Core that we partner with academic community hospitals, but we also partner with the cancer coalitions throughout the state, the people who are at the front lines really trying to reach out and, and make a difference. And we have joint grants with folks, one through the CDC actually. And so um, I think that is a, a very effective model um, of care. Dr. Diener, Dr. Stout, you wanna weigh in on that? Sure, from a policy perspective, uh, I'll shed some light, a little further light for you on the model of military medicine. Uh, and I think 
one of the papers that we published out of the prospective surveillance that has probably been one of the most important papers that I think and one of the one that really should be more highly regarded and should really lead to a research agenda around this topic. Uh, and that was led by Dr. Alicia moorhead Gee. Well, she's a doctor now. She was a, a research student doing a transitional year in our lab. She did two years with us and she published the article on racial disparities in physical and functional domains in women with breast cancer. So let me tell you about military medicine. What doesn't happen in military medicine are a lot of the barriers to access to care high co-pays, we don't, we don't have those. I was not in the military, I was a civilian working at the Military Medical Center in the Cancer Institute. Um, but let me just read to you about what we didn't see in our African-American population, the results section. No differences were found between groups, African-American and white, for breast cancer type, stage, grade, or tumor size surgery type or number of lymph nodes sampled. Our patients, because they had access to care, because they didn't have those barriers, we weren't diagnosing these women with later, more advanced stage disease. However, what we did identify was some of those genetic influences, differences in um, uh, triple negative, higher rates of triple negative tumors in African-American women. And then we got into what I would consider as a social construct, as Dr. Dean said, um, and women who were African-American were more likely to be employed as opposed to the white women who were homemakers. Those women also reported higher rates of social activities and lower rates of physical activity. Our patients had higher rates of courting, axillary web syndrome or scar tissue phenomenon the African-Americans did, and they also had higher rates of lymphedema. So there are differences here and we need policies, we need payment structures, we need to take down the barriers first of all, so that we can really get at some of these underlying issues because these women are different. The, this is a patient population we should be following more closely probably with more, more consistent screening. Um, in having identified that they, they experience these physical impairments more frequently. And it wasn't because they had bigger tumors or had bigger surgeries. It's because this is the construct with which that individual has come from and lives and functions in, and it contributes to this level of impairment. So they need a different level of care. So I think until, until we're able to establish institutional and clinical policies that enable prospective care until we have the payment policies that help to support those. We're gonna to continue to miss this. We're gonna to continue to fail in, in enacting models that help us with precision medicine, specifically when we have the, the data and the information that tell us exactly what patient population we should target and how we should do it. Okay. Who or which organizations really need to be at the table to make some of these changes? Um, or any other comments into what we've already discussed uh, this evening. I would welcome it, I would open up any other comments that we haven't made yet. So I, I think this actually kind of harkens back to something that Dr. Fowler was saying about just having, thinking about having diverse teams to, to tackle challenges. Um, and I wanna elevate um, a, a group that I work with called Family Reach and part of their medical board, um, which is a, a, a nonprofit that helps with uh, charitable care for people who are facing high costs due to cancer. And one of the things that I really love that they do is they bring together the business community, they bring together health researchers, they bring together patients. I mean, they really, really think about how do we engage all of the possible players um, in tackling some of these big issues. And in that case, it's a high, high cost due to cancer, right? The financial toxicity of cancer. But I think that that is a model that really should be applied more often. And I, I've seen one of the reasons I worked with some of these other folks, for example, like Dr. Katie Schmitz, who's an, an exercise physiologist, is because of initiatives that um, the NIH funded to do transdisciplinary work. Um, so for me, I think that we need to be thinking about, given the complexity of the healthcare system, we need to be expanding some of the audiences that we've been including and thinking about. One of the, um, I recently published a paper that talked about the various systems 
that that people intersect in, in, when they when they think about cancer care. And one of the things I think we don't talk about is, for example, pharmacy benefit management. Right? Are, are we talking with them? Are we understanding how they play into people's cancer medications? Um, you know, are we including them in the solutions, or, or are we just saying, you know, that's the business community and we stay out of it? So um, I. I, I don't have a concrete answer, but what I would say is I do think we probably need to think more creatively if we're going to really get to some of those multi-level interventions and solutions um, that Dr. Stout and Dr. Fowler have been talking about. I'll also further invoke Dr. Schmitz here because she is leading a national initiative right now called Moving Through Cancer. It's a, um, a, an initiative of exercises medicine within the American College of Sports Medicine. This is another group of individuals that we have to engage. Exercise professionals, personal trainers, they have a lot to bring to the table to offer in helping to community-based exercise programs, engaging our communities, our patients, where they're at, helping them understand this, this concept of moving more, being healthy throughout cancer treatments. Um, nutrition is another, we really haven't touched on that, but I feel very strongly about having nutrition consults. Many times individuals are um, mistaken. They believe they'll have uh, their cancer treatments and they'll lose weight and they gain weight. Um, there's so much endocrine change that occurs um, in, in women going through breast cancer treatment. Um, I, I think the nutrition um, organizations, nutrition policy also could be augmented, but the exercise component, lifestyle and behaviors um, that we can address with a strong evidence base, as strong of an evidence base as we have in exercise, um, we, again, payment policies, training and education for those individuals to make sure they have the right level of education to manage individuals with cancer. They bring a lot to the table. We just have to bring them in and enable. So let me just throw out one more thing. What about telehealth? Do you think that's too out there for rehabilitation and survivorship care? Or do you think it's something that could decrease the disparities gap, especially when we think of, again, serving Georgians serving individuals in more rural areas. Yeah, let me just give a plug for one of your sponsors, which is the Oncology, the um, Academy of Oncologic Physical Therapy. Um, they have published a number of uh, articles, a recent special issue, looking at the use of telehealth. And a lot of this has been driven by COVID. We've seen a lot of changes in cancer care driven by COVID, right? We are, uh, for clinical trials, we're letting drug delivery go to primary care physicians. Wow, that's never happened before. Um, we've enabled telehealth. Um, we are, um, I'm in the midst right now of data collection for a qualitative research project to understand the components of telehealth and telerehabilitation models that exist right now from people who had to transition quickly to COVID what is what does a best practice look like? How does your practice function? How do you market? What type of staff do you have? What education? So we're really looking at, we're doing one-on-one -on -one interviews right now um, with individuals who responded and qualified um, for the study. We are not looking to assess research programs. We're not looking at exercise programs that are a part of a research study um, because that's perhaps not a sustainable model for us to hold out as, um, as a best practice. So we really are engaging those, uh, those clinical uh, or those community-based exercise programs. I think you can absolutely do great work engaging just like this. You can problem solve, you can talk, you can empathize, you can meet someone where they're at, you can help show them where to stand in the corner and do a stretch that they need to do um, because you're seeing them in their own environment. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from where we've gone in the forced and rapid transitions um, to manage these individuals during COVID. And I hope that we will, that's another big policy need is to continue to fund uh, telemedicine and telerehabilitation because we're starting in some areas to see that collapse. Everybody's saying, well, we're going to go back to normal now and we're just not going to pay for that anymore. And that's, that's, that's the wrong answer. So the more we can develop the evidence base for 
um, adoption of those programs, acceptability of those programs, you know, the best practices around that, you know, the cost, the feasibility. Um, hopefully we can make a case for those to be sustainable. And I'd like to give a shout out to for Turning Point because they rapidly um, were an early adopter of, of tele rehab and were very successful during uh, COVID. And now um, under Jill's leadership and Marilyn's leadership, they've engaged an international group um, of physical therapists. So working with ways to reach women again who don't have that um, access to care. Any other final comments from any of the panelists um, as we wrap up here and we'll go to questions pretty soon, but I wanna make sure that none of you have any other last final comments to make. Jill, maybe we can go ahead with some questions from the audience. Great, thanks everyone for a great conversation, great discussion. We have a few questions and for all of the, the people watching, please feel free to add any questions to the Q&A, especially as our conversation may bring up some, some new questions. Um, I have a question and it's directed um, specifically at Dr. Dean and Dr. Stout, um, but obviously Dr. Fowler, welcome to, to uh, chime in as well. Um, just if you could share um, some studies or research related to the disparity um, among black women with related to breast cancer related lymphedema. Um, Dr. Stout, I know that you uh, mentioned Dr. Moorhead Gee's study, but there are others and I know that this is an area that you've both um, worked in. And I'm going to add a, a second part and really maybe a little more specifics on how we can address that. Um, in terms of the uh, higher rate of breast cancer related lymphedema in black women? So this is really, so, this is an interesting question. Um, and in part, I, 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 Dr. Prentice's, who, who asked, Dr. Prentice who asked the question said a clear disparity. And this is where it actually gets a little bit murky for me. So mm -hmm. there have been several studies that at least descriptively show that, um, that lymphedema, um, incidence, lymphedema onset is higher among black women than other women. But when you account for all of the other social factors, right, then that disparity goes away. And that's, I think, so, even some of what Dr. Stout is saying, right? So it's, it's not something, right, it, right there's, a, there's a social context here that we can address. However, and I have a paper on this and Dr. Prentice, the paper also has some citations, which should also be helpful. So I'll be sure to send that your way. Um, you know, when we show up for care, right, we don't show up adjusted, essentially, for all of those other things, right, we don't show up controlling for our income, or we don't show up controlling for um, our education level, we show up as whole people. So on one hand, while part of the literature says, well, when you take account of all of these other factors, there actually is no disparity, people will still show up in clinical care as, you know, a Black woman with a higher rate of lymphedema, right? So mm -hmm. I think, that's an important distinct, distinction and nuance that needs to be made. All that to say, the, the, the literature is kind of saying two different things, right? We st even, even if we don't see that disparity, Black women will, will still need additional care and support around lymphedema because of the different social factors that Black women face, I think is to, to, to sum that up. Dr. Stout, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would also suggest um, we, there are some different risk factors for that population. If we are monitoring prospectively, there are different risk factors in African-American women that we should be looking at. Um, you know, we look at uh, risk factors in general and we say things like very general and very broad sweeping statements about uh, BMI and escalating BMI over the course of treatment. Um, and that's different for triple negative women. It's different for African-American triple negative women. The risk is much greater. So should we be screening those women monthly, perhaps? You know, prospective surveillance was every three months. Should it be monthly? Should we be putting them prophylactically into compression garments um, to help to perhaps mitigate a swelling episode um, before it occurs and tips them into the development of lymphedema? So. There are um, there there have been and over the over several decades, um, you know, Le Leslie Bernstein out of uh, University of, of Penn Epidemiology had done some early work in looking at the differences in these risk factors 
Um, age is different, but really a lot of these differences also are activity driven, um, are you know, socioeconomically driven. And so I think until we can start to account for the whole individual, you know, we, we talked about a risk stratification model in a paper that um, I, I led, a group that I led from NIH that was published in Cancer last year. And we said, it's great to think about cancer and all of the side effects of treatment and monitoring and screening for those because we know those risks are there. But until we take the holistic perspective of understanding um, the cardiometabolic status of our patients and how that will change with treatment, the behavioral choices and lifestyle choices that our patients make, what types of interventions do we need to modify those if, if modification is necessary, the environmental factors, the environment that they live in, the construct around them, their, their financial status, mm -hmm. et cetera, until we really begin looking, oh, and that pesky thing called aging and age-related risk factors we have to think about too. But until we really start thinking holistically, that's, that's when we will be able to specify that treatment, more frequent screening, more frequent intervention. Um, and unfortunately, I, I guess I would say that I agree with Dr. Dean's um, premise that there isn't just this clear here's where the, the, the difference is between an African-American cohort and a white cohort or an Asian cohort. Um, there are various and different nuances and that makes it all the more important for us to specify the ongoing surveillance. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, how would you suggest equipping uh, or training uh, rehab staff or rehab professionals to address the unique needs of different minorities and subgroups? And I think the acknowledging that not all rehab staff can represent all subgroups. Um, any thoughts on that and sort of equipping um, these, these rehab folks with um, the tools to best address um, some of the unique needs of different groups? Yeah, so I'm gonna give a huge shout out to Dr. Lisa Van Hoos, who was the earlier moderator. Um, Lisa has uh, created literally a village, a, a, a community resource, a professional resource. She brings people together through the Ujima Institute. And so you can, you can find that online. Um, I'm looking at, it's U-J-I-M-A, I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T-E, so Ujima Institute. And really she has created resources and tools so that healthcare providers, physical therapists, occupational therapists can educate themselves. What is allyship? How do I speak up on it to, to be the person who can highlight some of these issues and disparities? Uh, because my voice is different and it will resonate differently. Me as a researcher, um, you know, me in, in the field that I am in, how, um, how, do I, how do we build and maintain communities that can help to support um, individuals of different and varied race? So I, I think they have done, they have um, collaborative group meetings online. She has resources, tools. Um, it, it's, it's really an amazing, she's, she's built a, it's a village that she has built um, and it is very open and willing to, uh, available and she's very willing to engage over that. Does she have an online platform for that training right now? Yep, that's the um, uh, ujimainstitute.com. Mm -hmm. Dr. Fowler, do you, would you like to comment? Yeah, I was just going to add to um, Dr. Stout's remarks that, um, that folks add an evaluation component to their training and implementation um, of these models that they may not have been privy to previously. So they, they can know if, you know, know exactly what's working, what isn't, what uh, skill building is actually ha uh, happening, where they might be missing the mark. I think an evaluation component is necessary. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, this is uh, really from a patient perspective, but I think we as healthcare providers also help educate our patients um, on these things. What's the best way to address these concerns with your healthcare provider who may not be adv as advanced uh, on the awareness of disparities and may be unresponsive when these challenges are, are raised? Um, and so really that's to the patient, but again, to us as providers in, 
in coaching our patients. Would anyone like to tackle that? Oh, I have no takers. Okay. Um, <laughs> my, sorry, I was, just, I, I was actually just, laughing because my, my initial answer was, if you're a patient who feels that way, get a different provider. Yes. <laughs> I was like, go to somebody well, else. Mm-hmm. Go to somebody else. But I, I actually thought maybe this question was coming from the perspective of a peer. So, right, if you're talking with another provider who is dismissing you, right, um, what, what do you do? So I, I think this is another area where we actually need to think multi-level, um, right? There is that inter- interpersonal aspect of trying to convince someone else. But I also think that hospital systems need to be incentivized to handle disparities. And I know a little bit about this. So one of my doctoral students um, works for the state of Maryland and does something around hospital accreditation. And they have been putting in metrics around disparities that are associated with hospitals being re-accredited. And that then requires now that the hospital does everything it can to make sure its providers and other people are on board with um, with thinking about disparities and acknowledging that they exist and figuring out how to how to how to work through the disparities in their local community, um, and I know that's an unsatisfying answer because going to structural change right is not what you need to get better care tomorrow. Um, so I say to get better care tomorrow, leave your provider. But then also some of this is is essentially beyond what we can do as individuals. I think it's really going to be structural change. Other people might have other thoughts, <laughs> ideas too. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it, the the to put place the onus on the patient is a whole heck of a lot, right? You know, and it assumes that the patient has a level of um, knowledge um, that we oftentimes we don't we don't have that information to be able to educate <laughs> um, our providers in that way. But um, to Dr. Dean's point, um, provider to provider. I think that it just, it really comes down to a level of basic decency around health outcomes. And if our conversations uh, between providers um, can really highlight uh, the kinds of practices that lead to positive health outcomes that all providers should want to see. And so I, you know, so those are the conversations, of course, research driven, Um, um, evaluation driven and that makes all the difference and of course the currency of published research and and present presentations um, to those uh, audiences that hold the purse strings as we talked about before but the the common decency between peers around this leads to positive health outcomes for survivors Gosh, I also feel like as a provider, if I can't sit and look my patient in the eye and have a heartfelt conversation about their concerns, I need to ask myself what I'm doing there. Uh, And that puts, we have to put some onus on the providers. They're busy. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot going on that may be medically urgent. Undoubtedly in cancer care, it happens. But really being able to sit and take the time with your patient, that is the most critical part, the reason we all became healthcare providers. And so I would, I guess I would put that on the provider to say, perhaps we need to think about how we do better in meeting our patients where they're at, first of all. But for the patient, if you're feeling like you're not being met, I agree with Dr. Dean, and it's, it's much, much harder to do uh, than it is to say, change providers. It's like changing your hairdresser, right? That's, it's much, much harder to do than it is to just say, go somewhere different. Um, But you may even consider opening the door for a conversation, that opportunity, um, and suggest that you're struggling finding shared values with with this individual that's your provider and say, I don't know if we share the same perspective and vision on me and my needs. And I want to talk about that. And maybe you can help me find a way for us to go forward together. And that, if that doesn't enact your provider towards better and different conversations, maybe they need to help you find someone else to manage your care. That's a, that's a really tough, it's a really tough situation. 
Yeah, and it's it's so uh, complex and convoluted given everything we've discussed here tonight already around health disparities for African American women in particular. There is often this um, power differential that can exist or at least um, postured by the healthcare provider if they don't have the kind of uh, mentality and thought around and perspective around their work that Dr. Stout is mentioning. And so I, I think it's just, you know, the huge side because we have to be so careful around giving the patient more to do when the healthcare yeah. provider should show up with those skills, with that perspective already. So my question is not to be answered this evening, but is this the conversation that is happening at the kinds of professional conferences or forums where you know oncologists and surgeons are meeting? You know, are uh, peer surgeons and doctors and oncologists holding um, uh, these discussions and holding the peers to uh, to task around this? Um, and even I think is important what Dr. Dean was saying, um, not only incentivizing, but every evaluation that I receive <laughs> from the hospital on, you know, I fill out with the greatest level of honesty. But what happens after that? You know, so I, I think that's another touch point around does the doctor see that? Um, is, does it go unchecked? You know, so those kinds of questions. Um, I think healthcare providers, there needs to be uh, more accountability there. So thank you all. I'm getting the little signal that we are on time here. We have to wrap up. I want to generally thank the panelists. Your stories have just been simply enlightening. Your work is passionate. I appreciate your service, your research. Please keep it going on behalf of our um, patients and our cancer survivors. Jill? Thank you, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Stout, Dr. Dean, Dr. Gabram. Great discussion, and I think you've maybe asked a question, Dr. Fowler, that needs to continue in our next forum. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. We the conversation or the or today for those of in other time zones, uh, we are going to continue the conversation with our fourth and final forum on racial disparity in breast cancer survivorship. It's Wednesday, September eighth, same time and. And we hope you'll join us for that. Um, next slide. Thank you to, for our champions for change, so many of whom have been panelists and moderators and are supporting the kind of work that we're trying to do and continuing this conversation, as well as helping us disseminate the information from these forums. And you'll hear more about that in September. And next. And again, one more, one last thank you. Um, great conversations um, to our panelists and, and our moderator. Thank you. And thank you to our sponsors. Um, they've made this possible both through financial sponsorships as well as uh, sharing the word and spreading the information um, about our forum. So thank you again to our sponsors. And that wraps up our fourth in our series. So next slide, it's the final one. And again, here's uh, my email address, jbinkley um, at myturningpoint.org or bcsurvivorship at myturningpoint.org. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you have questions, comments, um, or, or input into our forums. We apologize for not getting to all of the questions, but we got to, to quite a few and uh, hope to see you again at the next forum in September. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.